It is the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Broadcasting from coast to coast. City to city, coast to coast. It's time for the Ryan Hickey Show on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. If it's happening in sports, it's being talked about right here. And here's your host, Ryan Hickey. Good Thursday morning and welcome into the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here with you on this gorgeous, warm, definitely unseasonably warm Thursday morning right here as we always are every Monday and Thursday on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We appreciate you joining in. We appreciate you tuning in. We do have a, a fun show, a jam-packed show. We have a lot to catch up on. I do apologize for missing Monday's show. Feel a little under the weather going into Sunday night. Feeling a little run down, so figure take a little bit of a preventative day, prevent myself from getting more run down, more sick, and hopefully, you know, not leave myself more susceptible to getting that damn virus that's been uh, flying around. So definitely hurt uh, missing Monday's show, especially after a another jam packed NFL Sunday. But definitely happy to be back here with you because we have whew, a lot to get into. As a reminder, as always, we're coming to you live from the Big Italy Pizzeria Studios. Well, it's great pizza, hot heroes, and phenomenal dinners. Check out Big Italy Pizzeria if you're on Long Island in Medford. Their sister pizzeria shop will say Joe's Pizzeria in Bayshore or online wherever you are at BigItalyPizza.com. Like I said, there's a lot to get into today. The Rays even the World Series at one game apiece. There's one aspect I'm looking at why the Rays can really take advantage and go win this World Series. Antonio Brown. He's suspended through week eight. It is now week seven, so he is eligible to come back after next week. There's already a team making a push for him, the Seattle Seahawks. Should they do it? Give my thoughts at 940. Top of the second hour. Roddy White had some interesting comments when it comes to Trevor Lawrence. When it comes to why Trevor Lawrence shouldn't go, uh, I should say, shouldn't go into the draft this year. Roddy White is advising Trevor Lawrence to go back to Clemson. I'll tell you why, he's half right at what team he is staying away from. Hint, it is the worst team in the NFL right now. Definitely uh, not too hard to figure that out. 1020. I wanted to get into the Dallas Cowboys, right? Total dumpster fire, total mess. Another year where they are underachieving. Two and four to start the year. They, to me, year in and year out with all the hype that they get, year in and year out with the expectations and the constant failure, the constant under delivering, underwhelming. They are the Michigan football, the NFL. I'll explain why and give you my uh, my reasoning for that. And as always, at 1040 Eastern, a Thursday special, Take These Pickies. I'm very excited. Rob Young, our celebrity guest picker this week, extremely confident to say the least. On social media earlier this week, called a shot, went to Babe Ruth, said I'm guaranteeing four out of five right selections today. It's a tough slate, I'll be honest. I was going through the games. This is honestly maybe the toughest slate overall, one to five, that maybe we've had so far through seven weeks. There's not many easy games in my mind to pick. Um... So we'll see, you know, first of all, we'll get to the root of Rob's confidence. Because if you watched, or if you remember, going back to 2020 or Apocalypse, Rob has taken a similar philosophy as my guy Cody was when he was battling for 2020 or Apocalypse. Super confident, very, you know, very outwardly showing his confidence. And maybe that intimidated his competitor a little bit. And obviously Rob's not really competing against anyone more about himself. But we'll see why Rob's so confident and if he can deliver on that guarantee, on that promise that he put out there early this week. That will be out, of course, as always, at 1040 Eastern. We do start the biggest news of the week, though. Um, We will get to the World Series in just about 15 minutes or so. But it's time. It is Tua time down in Miami. The Dolphins and Brian Flores officially yesterday, Wednesday morning, announced that he is making the move. He is betting Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tua Tungaroa. The number five overall pick last year, obviously, the great, phenomenal Alabama quarterback coming off an injury-plagued, really, career in Alabama, but really... When he dislocated his hip, that was the biggest injury that set a lot of teams back. It scared a lot of people, including yours truly here. I did a, a whole take and whole thought process about why I thought the Dolphins should not draft Tua Tungvalu because of the injury concerns and because the offensive line at that point last year was very shaky, was very bad, and I had my legitimate concerns that they could protect him uh, and not have basically a Joe Burrow 2.0 situation that's going on in Cincy right now. So Tua will be the starter next week. The Dolphins are on a bye this week. He'll be the starter next week going up against the Rams. Aaron Donald, no better way to start your NFL career than going up against one of the best defensive players to play the game right now. And the question is, the thought is, are the Dolphins making the right move in playing Tua? Is it time? Is it the right timing for Tua time in Miami? To me, honestly surprising, I'm kind of surprised myself here, 
The answer is yes. And more surprising, I'm actually shocked about how much pushback, how much blowback Brian Flores and the Dolphins are getting for making this decision now. Because listening to what Brian Flores has said, really since the jump, right, really since the beginning when they drafted Tua, they're taking their time. A few weeks ago, we talked about why he's being cautious with Tua, basically treating him as his own son. He, he wouldn't want, if Tua was his son, his head coach rushing him to play, coming off the hip injury, as we know. But to me, so far, listening to what Brian Flores has said, seeing how they've handled the situation, Flores and the Dolphins are playing Tua for the right reasons. It's not media pressure related. Brian Flores is not trying to save his job because no matter if they go, th- they're 3-3 three and three now. If they lose every single game and go 3-13, and 13, he's coming back next year. There's never been making the playoffs or bust. So he's not trying to save his job. He's not playing Tua because of media pressure or fan pressure or even ownership pressure. We've seen that before. There's no angst. There's no consternation from Brian Flores himself to try to get Tua on the field and rush him before it's too, well, I guess, but, you know, rush him on the field when he's not ready. He's playing Tua. Because Tua earned the right to be the starter. Here's Brian Flores yesterday basically explaining what went into the reasoning, what went into the logic of starting Tua Tomagaloa next week. Practice, we talked about it as a staff, personnel department. And we just felt like it was the best move for the team right now. And, uh, you know, uh, that's how we're going to move forward. Practice, talking about it with the team, thinking it's the right move for the team right now to give them the best chance of winning. And I agree, because I think Brian Flores has handled the situation perfectly so far. He's let Tua develop in practice. He's learning the speed of the game. And he's kept him in practice really until he's making, you know, until he's ready to make the jump into the, into the real game, to the regular season. Tua's development was obviously hurt by the lack of offseason, the normal offseason, no OTAs, no training camp is there, but it's not real, not a usual training camp. Obviously, there's no preseason games to kind of get your feet wet. So he's had to basically show off in practice and play the best that he has in practice. And so far, according to Blind Flores, I'll explain a little bit what some Dolphins players said. It sounds like Tua has been really impressing in practice. Here's Brian Flores again. We talk about kind of situations like this on a weekly basis. Um, he's day-to-day. He's, you know, going to be back in a couple weeks. Uh, and this is no different than that. And, um, you know, we feel like, you know, through practice and meetings and walkthroughs um, that he's ready. And you know, that's, that's how we're going to go moving forward. We feel like through practice and meetings and walkthroughs that he is ready. He is impressing. He has a knowledge of the playbook. He's making the plays. So it sounds like to me, this is the decision that Brian Flores really didn't have to make. He didn't really have a choice in making, I should say. Because two in practice demonstrated to the team, to Flores, to the entire organization, he is ready to play. He is ready to go. It's time. And that's the way, honestly, it should be. We always try, we always think that the NFL and professional sports is a meritocracy, right? The best players play. That's not the case. That's not the case more times than not. Contracts have something to do with it. Money usually has always something to do with it. Players in the doghouse or not has something to do with it. It's not a guarantee that every single time the best players are going to play week in and week out. There's all these other exterior motivations, all these other factors that come into why some players play more than others. And even, you know, you read some reports from ESPN, there's plenty of Dolphins players that are talking to ESPN saying that they have noticed Tua's improvement in practice. It's been very noticeable in the past few weeks. So it's not something where he is forced to being played now. He hasn't earned the job. So Dolphins are playing some good football right now. They're 3-3. Three and three. Ryan Fitzpatrick has two of the better games of his season in blowing out the San Francisco 49ers on the road last week, dominating the Jets this past week. It's easy to kind of get lost in the sauce, we'll say, right? It's easy to kind of get caught up in the moment. Look at your record, say, th- we're 3-3. Three and three. Maybe we would expect to be 3-3 three and three right now. Ryan Fitz is, Fitzpatrick is playing really good. Maybe let's see if we can ride this. Maybe let's see if we can make a, a desperate attempt to make the playoffs. We're going to hold off on Tua, despite the fact that he's playing really well in practice so far, despite the fact that he is our future. He is the, he is the organization. Let's not forget. Ryan Fitzpatrick is, knows he's a placeholder. He's said it plenty of times before. He is playing until Tua is ready. The goal was never to bring Ryan Fitzpatrick in to make a postseason run, to make a playoff run. So I love the fact that Brian Flores isn't sacrificing the future at a long shot, at an improbability of making the playoffs. Because right now, again, they are in second place in the AFC East. The AFC, really the NFC too, it's wide open. 
The Bills have shown some vulnerabilities. The Patriots are struggling. Really, there's not many teams outside the Chiefs right now that are really dominating the AFC. So there's a chance that, especially with the extra playoff spot this year, if the Dolphins wanted to try to make a run, they could. But Brian Flores isn't falling into the trap. He's not doing what Ron Rivera is doing right now, losing sight of the future. And that's figuring out what you have in Dwayne Haskins. Figuring out if he can be the guy moving forward, or just to draft another quarterback next year. Instead, Ron Rivera is trying to make a, a desperate run, an improbable run, because the NFC East is so bad. And I think that sacrificing the future for the present, to me, is very short-sighted and is not a winning philosophy. So yeah, it's tough to bench a guy in Ryan Fitzpatrick, who is so well-liked in the locker room. Who, again, who's playing some of his best football right now. It's not like Ryan Fitzpatrick just threw five interceptions the last two games was the reason why the Dolphins lost two in a row and just an easier to digest move that makes sense to put two in. He is benching Ryan Fitzpatrick when Ryan Fitzpatrick is playing at his best. It's not easy. Brian Flores said it's not easy. But hearing Flores talk about two impressing in practice, hearing Dolphins players tell ESPN that they've really noticed Tua's improvement over the past few weeks in practice. To me, it sounds like there's no choice there. There's no option. Two is playing too well. He's playing too good to the fact that you couldn't play him. And that's how you keep players playing hard for you. That's how you keep the system uh, of buying in. And that's how Brian Flores, so far through a season and a half, despite the record, despite the talent, that's why the Dolphins are a pesky team. That's why the Dolphins have legitimate buy-in. When they were tearing it down six games through last year, when they looked like one of the worst teams in football history, not just of last year, they were, they were losing at historical records. Whether, whether it was point differential, whether it was just lack of offensive scoring, their defense was giving up points left and right. That team bought in, they turned it around. Part of that buy-in is making the best decision for the team. Making the tough decision, but you know it's the right thing for the team. To me, that's what this decision is. Starting to it right now, to me, is the best decision for this team going forward. May it hurt your playoff shot? Maybe. I don't trust Ryan Fitzpatrick to play this well for a full 16-game slate. There's a reason why he's bounced off from team to team to team. He has played well in spurts, but he's also played really bad in spurts. So to me, this is absolutely the right move. And I do trust, because, my, again, my biggest concern with the Dolphins taking Tua is their ability to protect him. And you're going to have two rookies, and Robert Hunt and Solomon Kilney, at right tackle and right guard that are now going to protect his blindside because, remember, he's a lefty thrower. And their first-round pick, Austin Jackson, is on IR. So you, are, you have to be confident, and I do trust at least, that Brian Flores is confident enough in his offensive line that they can give Tua an opportunity to have success, to not, again, be ragdolled like we're seeing with Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. Can't have that. So I trust Brian Flores and how he's handled everything so far to me. I think this is the right move. I think it is Tua time. See what you got. See if you can develop them and continue to push now for the future. Start to make that move to turn the ship around. And now you start thinking about winning. You start thinking about building your young core together. And how can we develop that? How can we put our pieces around Tua and this offense to make sure that they are successful going forward? So I think the timing's right. I think this is the right move for the Dolphins. I think, and I agree with Brian Flores, that it is Tua time in Miami. So I'm, sure, I'm curious your thoughts, because there's been actually a lot of disagreement, more than I figure. I'm actually shocked about the amount of pushback, the amount of criticism that Brian Flores and the Dolphins have gotten over making this move. They're not making the playoffs with Fitzpatrick. Don't get kind of lured in, fall for the shiny object in Fitzpatrick playing more the last two weeks. We've seen this throughout his entire career. He can have one of the best games. He could be, and any, any given week, he could be the best quarterback to play that day. Easily. But just as easily as he can be the best, he can also be the worst. So sure, maybe two won't be as good as Fitzpatrick is this year. Right? He's a rookie, learning curve. Fitz, again, has the ability to throw for 350 yards and three touchdowns on any, any given week. Maybe two is not there yet. But I can promise you the lows aren't going to be as low. That fits is when he'll throw three interceptions, four interceptions, have just an awful, brutal day. So I'm curious your thoughts. Is it the right time for two a time in Miami? Facebook, Worldwide Sports Radio Network, Twitter, WWSR and underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter, where you can uh, tweet at me as well. Periscope, Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Comment on any of the live streams. We'll get your thoughts on if it's the right time for two a time. And when we come back, Game 2 of the World Series concluded last night. The Rays evened it up.
at one game apiece. There's one area where the Rays can really take advantage of and make this a real series. I'll explain what that is next. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back Welcome to the back Ryan Hickey Radio Show. Radio. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We are back here on this Thursday morning, pumping it up, because it is two a time in Miami. If you're a Dolphins fan, I'm sure you are pumped. You are fired up. One of my best friends is a huge Dolphins fan. He is fired up. It's time. It's two a time. And I agree. As someone who, again, advised the Dolphins not to draft Tua. As someone not scared by Tua's medicals per se, but more scared of the Dolphins' ability to protect Tua. That, again, we're seeing with Joe Burrow in Cincinnati, where he is just getting ragdolled. He is getting crushed week in and week out. And really the biggest conversation and the biggest discussion with Joe Burrow is just can the Cincinnati Bengals keep him alive to the end of the season? Like, it's getting so bad where there's already been uh, talks and discussions on talk radio, on shows that I work on. Ken Carmen, great host in Cleveland, by the way, if you want to listen on Saturday mornings on CBS Sports Radio. Where he's already discussing the thought of benching Joe Burrow in a few weeks. Not because of his poor play, because he's playing well. Not because of the, the Bengals' record. Just in order to protect himself. To protect Joe Burrow to, to allow him to basically not turn into Andrew Luck 2.0. As a Colts fan, I saw it. They let Andrew Luck just get murdered and crushed back there for years and years and years. Did not address the offensive line. And as we know, that led to his retirement early. Right as the Colts got good, right as the offensive line was able to protect him, that's when Andrew Luck retired. So I was very nervous and very concerned that that same thing would happen in Miami. But to Brian Flores' credit, I've loved the way he's gone about handling Tua Tagovailoa so far. I think he's done it perfectly. I think he's easing him along. And now to the point where... Flores has said it, and you hear players talking about it as well. Tua is impressing so much in practice that it sounds like there was really no decision to make. It was time to start Tua. So I'm curious your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Radio Network, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. You can comment on Periscope. You can comment on Facebook. But get your thoughts. Is it the right time for Tua time in Miami? Do you like the move to start Tua time below? The Dolphins are 3-3. Three and three. Going into a bye, they'll start him next week against the Rams. Ryan Fitzpatrick benched, playing some of the best football, really, of his career. If you watch any of the press conference yesterday, you hear how devastated he was to hear the news that he's not playing anymore because he felt like for the first time in his career, really, since Buffalo, that this was his team, despite the fact that he's mentioned multiple times that he's a placeholder for Tua. But okay. He was devastated. He was gutted with the news. But it is officially Tua time in Miami. So get your thoughts. Again, Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. Also on Twitter at Ryan Hickey Show. Tweet your thoughts, write your thoughts. We'll get to them and read them throughout the duration of the show. We've got some baseball news to talk about. we got some baseball. Because we've really, honestly, we've got ourselves a World Series. Rays outside take game two, 6-4. World Series now even at a game apiece. So, you know, math major that I am. One game for the Rays, one game for the Dodgers. Best of seven, which that means, you know, Five games less, it's a best of five. First round of three wins, obviously, does win the series, does win the World Series. So who will win? Right, we're even. Through two games, we didn't have a chance on Monday to preview the World Series. So now that they're even, that will be essentially a best of five series. I'm going to try to do that here. Through Knowing what we know through two games, who will win the World Series? Who has the edge here going to game three and beyond? To me, I think it's the Rays. I think the Tampa Bay Rays. Five games left going through the rest of this World Series. Have the edge, have the advantage to win. And I'll tell you why. Finally. Now, it took all postseason. Hopefully, if you're a race fan, this is not just a flash in the pan. This is not just a one-off. But the biggest error that they've struggled in the entire postseason so far, offense, right? Scoring runs, getting runners on, getting runners in. They did that yesterday and did it well. Because they've really been below average offensively, really, this entire postseason. Starting really with that Yankees series that went five. The Astros series we saw was hot and cold. They played really well the first three games then sunk the, la- the middle three games before turning on in game seven. 
their offense has been the one inconsistency, really, throughout the duration of the playoffs so far. And last night, it came alive. And really, more importantly, not only did it come alive, it came alive with some of their best players that have been struggling offensively so far. Brandon Lau, their best hitter this season in the regular season, has been just ice cold in the playoffs. Last night for Brandon Lau, two hits, both home runs, he drove in three. Huge to kind of see the ball go out of the park, really get that confidence going. Joey Wendell, another guy who's a great hitter for the Rays in the regular season, has been pretty quiet through the postseason, three out of eyes last night. So yeah, Lau and Wendell were the two players that the, the Rays needed to get going the most, driving all six runs combined last night. Manny Margot, three times on base yesterday. That's what the Rays need. That's what they were desperate for all the postseason. They finally got it going yesterday. But like I said, is it a one-off? They struggled the entire postseason. Now one game, now granted, a massive time, but one game, they played well in game two last night. It's hard to extrapolate that performance throughout the rest of the series. This is why I think the Rays have the advantage going forward. And this is why I think that they will continue to have more offensive success. They are able, and they have in game two, we're able to take care, really, of the one Dodger weakness on this team. And that's been their bullpen. And it wasn't even a glaring weakness in the regular season because their bullpen actually was, I think, the second best ERA-wise in all of baseball. But the postseason, that's been different. The bullpen postseason ERA so far for the Dodgers is 3.80. A full run worse right, or higher, depending on how you want to look at it, but either way, it's the same thing, than the regular season where they were 2.74. So again, the second best bullpen in the regular season 2.74 ERA now is ballooned to 3.80. And now they're one of the worst bullpens in baseball in the postseason, at least. And guess what? With the way the trends are going in baseball, with the way baseball is managed, the Tampa Bay Rays are going to see more of the Dodger bullpen than less. Now they have Walker Buehler going on Friday for the Dodgers. The race, their guy. Expect them to dominate. Okay. Fine. But whether it's Clint Kershaw getting back on the bump. They're going to start Julio Arias in game four. If Tampa can get in that bullpen and get it in early, they have they are favored to win this series. Because really, as a Mets fan, I can relate it to this. I can't really relate to watch, you know, watching much of my teams in the World Series, but I can relate it because the Mets were in the World Series back in 2015. And this, to me, if I was a Dodge fan, what I'd be concerned about. Because this is really what haunted me as a Mets fan. When the Mets played the Royals in 2015, the one thing about the Royals was their starting rotation was iffy. It was all right, but their bullpen was elite. It was locked down. So it was one of those things where you want to knock around the starting pitcher. You want to get into the bullpen early. But at the same time, getting to the bullpen early was playing to the Royal strength. They would bring in guy after guy after guy who would throw hard, get strikeouts, and the Mets offense was lifeless. That's sort of what I see here with the Rays. Now they're starting pitching with Blake Snell. Sorry, with Blake Snell, with Charlie Morton. I think it's better than what the Royals had in 2015. But that bullpen is similar. Will you bring in guy after guy after guy? They're throwing hard. They have nasty stuff. And it's just wave after wave after wave of dominant pitching. So if you're going to see more of bullpens, more bullpen innings, to me that favors the race. And that's the way this game is trending. So yes, Clayton Karsha pitched well in game one. Kind of, you know, brush off some of that postseason um, horror that he has been. Let's see him do it again. I want to see him do it again. One outing in game one doesn't convince me that all of a sudden now he's kind of fixed this postseason jinx that he's been. So you can get him, you rough him up, get him, or, you know, get him out early, get into that bullpen. You're going to see at least one more bullpen game, probably in game six. That favors the race. And guess what? They're one of those teams. But they don't score a lot of runs, as, as I just mentioned, right? Outside of yesterday, they, their offense has been struggling mightily. But what they do do really well, what they are a lead at, is that once they get that lead, if they can get it early, they don't give it up. Again, that bullpen is so elite, that's so good, they shut it down. This year, regular season and postseason, the Rays, when they score first, are 32-7. and seven. When they score first, that's it. They get a one nothing lead. More times than not, the game's over. They're the best in baseball when they score first. That's a testament to their pitching. That's a testament to their bullpen. So as we see the series go deeper, as we see bullpens get more and more relied upon, because that's how, that's how baseball is managed, to me that favors the Rays. And that's why I'm picking the Rays to close out this World Series. I think they'll get it done. I think they'll beat the Dodgers. 
So I'm taking the race. I'm curious your thoughts here. Watching the World Series, seeing what we saw so far, where are you leaning? Which way are you taking? We're even at one. So essentially, you know, it's still a, a clean slate, we'll say. So despite the fact that we're trying to preview and discuss the World Series and give predictions after two games, being even, I think we could still do it. I think we, can, we can get by. We'll squeeze by. So I'm curious your thoughts. If you're watching the World Series, if you're into it, who do you think will win the World Series? I'm taking the Rays. I'll go in seven. How they go the distance? Because you know what? The Rays have played every series to the distance so far. So why not make it the World Series as well? But I think the Rays is the bullpens get more and more relied upon, more and more used. That favors Tampa Bay. So curious your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSR underscore radio. And Ryan Hickey Show also on Twitter. Who do you have winning the World Series? Is this the year finally the Dodgers get over the hump? They've signed Mookie Betts to an already star-studded lineup. Clayton Kershaw's pitching really well. Walker Buehler, again, is the ace of the staff. This is a bullpen that still has talent. Second-best bullpen in all baseball in the regular season. Has been able to figure it out a little bit on, on um, in, the, in the postseason. But there's still talent there. Will they figure it out when they get it together? So taking your thoughts, who won the World Series, Rays or Dodgers, on Facebook, World or Twitter Network, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio, at Ryan Hickey Show. So get your thoughts. And when we come back, Antonio Brown, his suspension is over after week eight. Well, week eight is next week. So after next Monday night, Antonio Brown is eligible to sign with the team and start practicing. There's one team already rumored that they are really trying to make a push to go sign Antonio Brown. So who the team is and why it's a big, big, big mistake. When the Ryan Hickey Show returns right here on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. It, it, it's the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back Welcome to the back Ryan Hickey, Hickey Show. Show. Right here on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. And we are back here on the Worldwide Sports Radio right on this Thursday morning. A warm, unseasonably warm. It's going to be over 70 degrees today, at least here where I am in Long Island. So if you're having some nice weather to enjoy it, definitely enjoy it. Can't beat that for uh, late October, that is for sure. So a lot to get to here. Top of the hour. Why Trevor Lawrence should follow Eli Manning, should follow John Elway. Jets fans, you won't be happy with this one, I'm sorry, but it's what he has to do for the best of his career. And of course, very excited, Hickey's Pickies, week number seven. Nick McCool, week number six. Besides being just a great radio guest, a great guy overall. Love Nick. Great guy, great guest. Always fun on the air, always love having him on. He's also a great picker. Four and one this week. Almost, Mike Leach almost helped him out here to get him to five wins. But four and one. Very impressive showing so far from Nick McCool. Easily in second place by far. Just behind the smart and the incredible Lauren Clark, who's still perfect record at 5-0, and is undefeated so far. She is sitting in first place. Great job by Nick. 4-1. and one. Speaking of 4-1, and one, our celebrity guest picker, Rob Young, my guy, guaranteed he is going at least 4-1 and one this week. It's a tough, tough slate of games, I'm telling you. By far. The longest I've took to pick these games, and I try not to even take them too seriously. Back and forth, back and forth. To me, this is a very tough slate of games. So Rob has his work cut out for him. We'll see which picks he goes, which side of the fence he's going to go to. But he is guaranteeing a 4 and one weekend. So we'll get his thoughts. We'll definitely see the root of his, his uh, confidence for sure. I'm very excited to see how that turns out. But again, that'll be Rob Young. Hickey's pickies in literally one hour from now. Exactly one hour from now. Set your timer if you got to come back. Hickey's Pickies, 1040 Eastern, 740 on the gorgeous West Coast. So there is one player that is going to return after week number eight. All the talent in the world. With that, all the baggage in the world. And there's already one team, one Super Bowl contender, flat out, one of the best teams in the NFL right now, that is making a real push to sign him. That's Antonio Brown, who can return after week eight. And now Adam Schefter yesterday was reporting that the Seattle Seahawks are making a real push to sign Brown who obviously is eligible, again, after week eight concludes next week, to join them, start practicing, and then be eligible to play in the games. Now, Schefter mentioned there are other teams in the mix. But right now, it seems like the Seahawks are the ones that are chasing Antonio Brown the most, that are the most motivated to sign the former star 
and current diva wide receiver. So the question is easy, to me at least, and I'd love to get your thoughts. Again, Worldwide Sports Eric on Facebook, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio, at Ryan Hickey Show on radio, uh, at Ryan Hickey Show on Twitter. Tweet me your thoughts right on Facebook, your thoughts. I'd love to hear them because talent-wise, the answer is yes. Distraction-wise, off the field-wise, everything else-wise, the answer is no to me, and that is should the Seattle Seahawks sign Antonio Brown. So they bring him in, should they make him a part of, of their roster because on paper, again, talent-wise, that would put, to me, Seattle over the top. By far, they'd be better than any other team in the NFC. I like the way the Buccaneers are trending. Again, by the, the league, uh, by the season end, I think the Buccaneers will be one of the best teams in the NFC. I think at the end of the day, they'll be the biggest ones to push the Seahawks. Um, but to me, the Seahawks, really the Packers, the Buccaneers, and the three teams so far that are kind of separating themselves from the rest of the pack um, in terms of being legitimate contenders to go to the Super Bowl for the NFC. I think this by far and away, if you sign Antonio Brown, talent-wise, skill-wise, would put Seattle over the top. But you have Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf already there, already with an elite passing offense for Russell Wilson. Now you had another weapon, another headache for the defense to worry about. There's too, too much skill, not enough bodies to cover all those guys. But with that said, with talent-wise, the answer being yes, I am absolutely advising the Seahawks, don't do it. Don't sign Antonio Brown. Don't fall for the shiny object. Don't, don't, don't do anything to derail all the momentum that you have right now. Because to me, that's what would happen if you sign Antonio Brown. I think it would be one of the biggest mistakes. I think it would honestly derail the Seahawks and really hurt their Super Bowl chances more than help. The upside to me does not outweigh the downside. And let's start the downside. Because really, there's more, there's more negative talk about than positive. He is a walking distraction. That a team like the Seahawks, a team that's undefeated, a legitimate bona fide Super Bowl contender with an MVP right now, the MVP through six weeks, is Russell Wilson on their team. They don't need him. They don't need that distraction. Because let's just go back here. Let's take a, a quick trip down memory lane. We're not going to go too far back either. Let's go back to 2018, two years ago. He was a member of the Steelers, first of all. Boy, does that feel like t- two years ago does not feel like Antonio Brown's on the Steelers. That feels like ages ago, millenniums ago. But let's not forget the last time that Antonio Brown was on a contender, the last time his team was in a playoff push, week 17, they're playing the Bengals. Now, the, 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 the Steelers need some help. But if the Ravens lose and the Steelers win in week 17, the Steelers are in the playoffs. So it's such a, it is a playoff game for Pittsburgh. Right? You have to win. There's no option when the Steelers lose to make the playoffs. So it's a must win. Week 17, the biggest game of the season so far. There's a fight in practice. He's upset about the way Big Ben is, is getting handled. Maybe Big Ben is not getting enough of the blame from the coaching staff, from the general manager, from the rest of the team. Antonio Brown leaves practice week 17 in a must-win game to keep your playoff hopes alive. Shows up to the game. Mike Tomlin says, you weren't at practice. You weren't at the meetings. We don't even know where you are. You're an actor. You're not playing. He quit on his team. Week 17, must win game, essentially a playoff game, because you got to win it. There's no other option. If you don't win, you're going home. He didn't show up. He quit on his team. Okay, that was 2018. You live and you learn, right? You get more mature with age. Maybe that was just for the first time he acted out. He, he learned from his mistake. He recognized, wow, I really did hurt the team. Can't do that again. Let's fast forward. Eight months. Let's go from December to August. December 2018 to August of 2019. Nine months, if you want to get real specific. We watch him play right in front of us on hard knocks. Remember when he was part of the Raiders? He got what he wanted in Pittsburgh. He asked for a trade. He didn't want to be part of the Steelers organization anymore. He got a trade to Oakland. He's on the Raiders. Happy to be on the Raiders. Happy to get away from that dumpster fire in his mind that was the Pittsburgh Steelers. And remember what happened as we watched on Hard Knocks week in and week out. Antonio Brown's not there to start the training camp. Why is that? He burned his feet in a cryotherapy chamber. Apparently wasn't wearing the right socks. Uh, Again, that's burns his feet. So that's the first thing. His feet are crusty. You're figuring out, okay, how can we get him back on the field? That's a whole issue. Then when the feet are okay. All right, the, the burns are good. I guess the blisters are wearing off. He's now able to run. His feet are working. He's able to run routes. He's able to be at practice. Remember then who goes from the feet? What happens next? The helmet. The NFL outlawed his helmet. The NFL is trying to um, get out all of the old helmets, right? Trying to enforce safety by doing so with player safety. They have these regulations about helmets. 
Antonio Brown's helmet was ruled to be not safe. It was too old, and they forced him to change helmets. Well, that was biggest deal in the world, right? Remember Antonio Brown taking his old Steelers helmet, painting it silver, trying to put the Raiders logo on and trying to pass it as a new helmet because he loved it so much. He couldn't play without his old helmet. So finally, finally, after weeks of drama, after weeks of illegally practicing in an old helmet he wasn't allowed to use, he finally settles on a new helmet. So the, 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 the feet, they start off burning, can't practice, they finally get healthy. Then it goes to the helmet. Very upset that he can't use his old helmet. For whatever reason, he can't play if he doesn't have his old helmet. Finally sucks it up, gets a new helmet. All right, now we're ready to play football, right? We're still in training camp, mind you. We're not even in week one yet. This is not playing out the duration of a year. This is playing out in the duration of two to three weeks. And then what happens? Once the feet are settled, once the helmet is settled, he figures, you know what? Ah, I don't really like Oakland. I want to get out of here. Before playing one game with the Raiders, and this is after the Raiders traded for him, they gave up draft picks. They gave Antonio Brown what he wanted. He still didn't like it. Wanted to get out and force his way out of Oakland before playing one game. Didn't play one down. Didn't play one snap. Forced his way out. So in, he quit on the Steelers in Week 17. Again, a, essentially a playoff game. Where they needed to win to keep their playoff hopes alive. He quit. Left practice. Didn't show up to any meetings. Didn't go to practice. Was inactive for Week 17. Nine months later, he has feet issues, he has helmet issues. All of a sudden, then he decides, wakes up one morning, I don't want to be a part of Oakland anymore. I want to go somewhere else. I want to play with Tom Brady. I want to be with the Patriots. I just don't want to be, I don't want to be anywhere but here. So he wants to get out of Pittsburgh and get out of Pittsburgh. Happy that he's in Oakland. All of a sudden, he wakes up one day, I don't want to be in Oakland anymore. I'm out of here. And the Raiders, again, after trading draft capital for him just a few months ago, don't even see Antonio Brown in their uniform for one snap. So he, in two consecutive years, quit on his team in one way or another. Why wouldn't he do it again? Why do we assume that all of a sudden now he's going to go to Seattle and be a good teammate? Be a good soldier. Fall in line. Listen to Russell Wilson. Listen to Pete Carroll. He didn't do it in Pittsburgh. He didn't do it in Oakland. Let's not forget, too. He was with the Patriots. He played a game. But even the Patriots couldn't deal with him. They cut him. So you have model organizations with the Steelers. Right? Mike Tomlin has been there since 2007. They have stable ownership with the Rooney family. They have stable front office. They have a stable head coach. Everything that was in place. It's not a dumpster fire. It's not a poorly run organization. It's one of the most successful and consistent organizations in all of football. He didn't like it there. The Raiders, another storied franchise. I like the direction that, the, uh, that John Gruden and Mike Mayock are going in. But we won't put them in the same categories as Steelers. And the Patriots, the same thing. They're in that Steelers category. Great ownership with Robert Kraft. Head coach, I imagine, Bill Belichick, who, again, has been there for two decades, who knows what he's doing, is well-respected. These two, If the Steelers organization and the Patriots organization, two of the most well-run, consistent organizations in all the NFL, couldn't handle Antonio Brown, what makes you think the Steelers are going to be able? I mean, what makes you think? Excuse me, the Seahawks are going to be able to handle Antonio Brown? Show me, please, one thing: the Seahawks have that the Patriots don't, that the Steelers don't, that he would fit in with the Seahawks, but not he couldn't fit in with the Steelers. He couldn't fit in with the Patriots. Because there's nothing I look at and say, you know what? That would be a good fit. That'd be a good idea. Because Antonio Brown would actually fall in line. Antonio Brown is about one thing himself. So whether it's not getting the, maybe the media coverage that he wants, maybe it's not getting the ball enough, maybe it's not like the play calling or his role. I don't trust Antonio Brown to go to Seattle midway through the year, mind you. Again, this is not coming in the offseason. We can work in chemistry. We can work with Russell Wilson on the timing. We can get used to playing with DK Metcalf, used to playing with Tower Lockett, learning the intricacies of the Seattle offense, and be comfortable by the time week one comes around, about really by the time the playoff comes around, after week 16 week 17, that you'll be able to be at your best. This is a guy who's going to come in after week eight. The Seahawks are undefeated, have one of the best offenses of all of all football. Again, Russell Wilson, if the season ended today, is the MVP. By far and away, the best player in the NFL this year. 
What makes you think Antonio Brown's going to come in and keep this team going forward? Elevate this team even more than they are right now. Because like I said, talent-wise, he's one of the best wide receivers in all of the NFL. He's unguardable. He's tough to tackle. He has great hands. He's great with the deep ball. There's not many flaws. He's a great route runner. There's not many flaws in the game, in the, in the talent-wise in the game of Antonio Brown. To me, again, it would make the Seahawks far and away the favorites in the NFC. It put them, put them right up there with me, to me, with the, Seahawks, uh, with the Chiefs, excuse me, for overall Super Bowl favorites. Maybe you'd even give the Seahawks a, a nod with the way Russell Wilson is playing so far. But I don't trust him to be a good teammate, a good soldier for three months. I don't think bringing in such a divisive personality would be the best thing for the Seahawks, which, again, they have gone through this for eight weeks. Think about it so far. Think how good that they have been playing so far through this stretch. I don't think Antonio Brown is the answer right now. Really ever, for any team, but not right now. When this team is rolling the way they are, where they have so much momentum going forward, the last thing they need is to be a distraction. The last thing that they need is to bring something that will slow down the train, derail the train, if you want to say because Antonio Brown has not proven really ever that he cannot be a distraction. So why bring that angst to the team? Why bring in that guy that has a great chance to really throw off everything you're doing? I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's a smart investment for the for the Seahawks. Because I also forget, the Seahawks aren't a team that's desperate for wide receiver help. DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, both on track to have 1,000-yard seasons. DK Metcalf is emerging as one of the best wide receivers in all the NFL. He's getting comparisons already in year number two to looking to have the skill set of Terrell Owens. But as we've seen so far, again, through a year and a half, he doesn't have the same distraction, that same personality that Terrell Owens that derailed his career. So if Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, two great receivers so far, Lighting it, up, lighting it up, excuse me, giving Russell Wilson all sorts of options. Seahawks have scored the most touchdowns in all the NFL. They have 23 touchdowns so far through the five games that they played. They're not desperate for wide receiver help. I mean, if anything, if they're going to add a player, it should be on the defensive end. Get a pass rusher. Get someone in the secondary. Truly, really, that's when they've been torched. That's where they've been getting hurt. That's where they need help and reinforcements on the defensive side of the ball. There's no questions about the offense. Questions about the defense. Just to me, I look at the, the possibility of the Seahawks signing Antonio Brown. There's rumors like this before because you had Russell Wilson working out with Antonio Brown in the offseason. Right? There's a video um, over the summer of Russell Wilson throwing routes at Antonio Brown. Apparently they're friends. I think Geno Smith, the backup uh, in Seattle, is also friends with Antonio Brown. So there's some connections there. But I don't think this is a good move for Seattle. I really don't. With the way they're rolling right now, with the way they're playing, I don't think the risk of bringing in a player as toxic as Antonio Brown is worth the reward that his skill set brings. This guy who, again, who has quit on the last two teams he's played on. He quit on the Steelers in Week 17 back in 2018. He quit on the Raiders before he even got a snap. Even played it down with the Raiders. They got rid of him. If teams like the Patriots, if teams like the Steelers are cutting bait or saying, you know what, he, he has all the immense talent in the world, but the distraction is not worth it, we can get it done with less talented players because they are less of a distraction, less of a headache, we're going to do it. I don't think Seattle, or I should say, I think Seattle should learn from the Steelers. Learn from the patrons and say, you know what? The talent is tantalizing. It is incredible. Not doubting the talent. But the distraction that he brings, the baggage that he brings, the disruption he would cause into this locker room. Again, eight weeks through. Things are rolling. To me, all he can do is make things worse, not better. That's why I'm very concerned, and I don't think it would be a good move at all if you're Seattle to bring Antonio Brown in and sign him on your team. So I'm curious your thoughts. I've said this before. I've gotten this right before. I'm not an Antonio Brown guy at all. I really don't think any team, to be honest, should, uh, should sign Antonio Brown. 
Because I just think the distraction outweighs the talent. There's too much. There's too much negativity. And that outweighs, to me at least, the positivity that brings with this talent. So curious your thoughts. If you're the Seahawks, another team rumored to be in the, in the uh, market for Antonio Brown, the Ravens. You have his cousin, Marquise Hallowed Brown, on the Ravens. Marlon Humphrey last night tweeted basically that he, you know, when he read Adam Schefter's tweet, he's focused on the part that said other teams are in the mix as well. Hence again, maybe the Ravens could be involved. Lamar Jackson has been on the record advocating for the Ravens to sign Antonio Brown. So playoff teams, Super Bowl caliber teams. In one way or another, one Antonio Brown on their team. Do you think it would be a good move? The Seahawks now at least are the ones that are set to make the big push. We'll focus on Seattle. But should any Super Bowl playoff contending team sign Antonio Brown? To me, the answer is hell no. Stay away 200 feet. Wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. Too toxic of a player. Too toxic of a personality to me, to me bringing halfway through a season. And expect the good to outweigh the bad. I just don't see it. So I'm curious your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Eye Network. Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show on radio. Again, damn it. Again. At Ryan Hickey Show on Twitter. I'm not sure what is going on in my brain. I miss a beat on Monday. I miss a show and all of a sudden everything's thrown off. Not my groove. At Ryan Hickey Show on Twitter. You can tweet me your thoughts. WWSRN underscore radio on Twitter. Worldwide Sports Network on Facebook. There we go. If you're on Periscope. Worldwide Sports Radio Network, tweet your thoughts, comment your thoughts. We'll get them. Should the Seahawks sign Antonio Brown? Would this be a good move for Seattle? And when we come back, Jets fans may want to turn the radio off. Or turn the stream down, I guess is what we'll say, because we're all digital, right? We're not on a radio dial, but, you know, the saying still goes. Jets fans, you may want to turn your radio off. Rodney White had some interesting comments he made yesterday that made the rounds. And that is basically advising Trevor Lawrence, don't go to the Jets, go back to Clemson. To me, Roddy White is half right. I'll explain why Trevor Lawrence should not go to the Jets no matter what. Explain why it is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back to the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We are back here on the Worldwide Sports right now. We're taking you to 11 a.m. Eastern. Still a ton to get into. The Dallas Cowboys, they are the Michigan football version of the NFL. I'll explain why that is in 20 minutes. And, of course, it's a Thursday, which you know what that means. Hickey's Pickies Week Number 7 Edition. Rob Young calling a Babe Ruth, guaranteeing four out of five right. The toughest slate by far, I think, of games to pick. So we'll see how he does. We'll get his thoughts going forward. And, as always, as a reminder... As we start this 10 a.m. hour, we are coming to you live from the Big Italy Pizzeria Studios. With its great pizza, hot heroes, and phenomenal dinner, check out Big Italy Pizzeria if you're on the island in Medford. If you're a little bit closer to the central Long Island, Bayshore, Joe's Pizzeria is there in Bayshore. Or if you're anywhere, if you're on Long Island, New York City, Jersey, Maryland, California, Idaho, wherever you are, right? We, we reach the, the globe here on the Internet. Crazy what you can do with the Internet connection. BigItalyPizza.com. So I told you before the break, Jets fans, you may want to turn your radio off for this one. Because right now, as you sit at 0-6, the only winless team left in the NFL, with a real legitimate chance to join the Lions, to join the Browns, in the 0-16 club, there's a real chance that you will get the number one overall pick. And Charles Robinson, a very respected NFL insider of Yahoo, great podcast I love listening to, um, Yahoo NFL podcast said the Jets get the number one pick. He is confirming he is 100% sure that they are drafting Trevor Lawrence. So if you're hearing that, if you hear that, excuse me, if you're Trevor Lawrence, does that get you excited? Should you want to hear that? Should you want to go to the New York Jets? Or should Trevor Lawrence pull a John Elway? Pull an Eli Manning? Prevent the Jets from drafting him? It's interesting. I want to play this clip because this is where it kind of started. This thought in my head started circulating. I want to play with Roddy White said, right? Former Atlanta Falcons wide receiver gave some advice for Trevor Lawrence. And that is to avoid the Jets. Now, the clip is a little bit longer. It's a minute long. I apologize. But I think this is good info here. This is Roddy White saying what Trevor Lawrence should do if the Jets get the number one overall pick. And, I, and if I'm Trevor Lawrence, if the Jets finish with no wins, I just go back to Clemson. 
Really? <laughs> yeah, I just go back. I'm just going to go back for another year. I don't want any part of that organization. That organization. Well, you're, a, you're a South Carolina guy. Do you have any, like, ins with the Clemson organization? Are you in Trevor Lawrence's ear? Like, don't leave if the Jets have the number one pick. No, I'm telling them right now. I mean, one of my uh, one of my cousins, uh, Tony Elliott, the, the co-offensive coordinator, uh, we went to uh, – we're actually related, and we uh, went to the same high school. So – I would tell him to tell Trevor, if the Jets get the first pick, don't go. Just stay. Just stay one more year in college and just enjoy your time, man. Just enjoy your time in college because it would be awful for you to get drafted by the Jets because they do not know how to put anything together over there as far as quarterbacking, as far as uh, weapons around the quarterback, as far as anything that has to do with offensive thing, talent. They can draft defensively, and they do a hell of a job on that side of the ball. As far as offense, man, that team is just bad at picking players. So there's Roddy White saying, Trevor Lawrence, go back to college. Go back to Clemson for your fourth and final year if the Jets are sitting there at number one because basically that will ruin your career. The Jets have been obviously a dumpster fire as we've seen. It would be a disaster. Go back to Clemson. You're better served. This is why now I don't agree with Trevor with, with Roddy White talking about defensive players. They've, the Jets have missed on plenty play of defensive players. Well, this is too long. But I think the, the point is interesting. The thought is interesting. Because to me, hearing what Roddy White is saying, tell Trevor Lawrence, go back to college, avoid the Jets. Don't go to the Jets. That'll be the worst thing for your career. I think Roddy White is half right. Lawrence should absolutely avoid going, uh, avoid going to the Jets. Don't do it. Don't get drafted by the Jets. Don't let your career go down that cesspool that is at that organization. But going back to college isn't the answer. Going back to Clemson for your four, for your fourth and final season is not the answer. Because guess what? The Jets are going to be right back there in a year from now anyway. So Trevor Lawrence has come out, start making some money now. And do whatever he can possibly do to prevent the Jets from drafting him. Just like John Elway. Just like Ian Manning. Either threaten to sit out, not play. But you have to pull whatever leverage you possibly can if you're Trevor Lawrence to avoid going to the Jets. Because it would be the worst possible career move for Trevor Lawrence. By far, by far, it would be the biggest detriment to his career, the biggest hurdles he'd have to overcome. And honestly, I'm not even sure for, with how great he is, that once in a generation talent that we hear the Trevor Lawrence is, I don't think even he could overcome just that toxic environment that is the New York Jets right now. Because honestly, when you look around the NFL, when you look around at which quarterbacks have success, which quarterbacks have struggled, which quarterbacks are, are, are right now uh, in a position to where they could be replaced. Just as important as the physical skills the quarterback has. Just as important, right? Because you need talent, obviously, first and foremost. You have to have talent to be good at your job. But equally as important to having the talent, having the physical skills to get the job done and be a successful quarterback, it's also extremely important to go to the right spot. Go to a competent organization. Go to where the team will give you a chance to have success. So no matter how great the quarterback is, it is tough to overcome a horrendous organization. It is tough to overcome incompetence. It's tough to overcome constant turnover of coaches and general managers, and you're in a slog where basically you can't get out. If you're in a malaise where you are there and you are bad year in and year out, and you can't figure it out. We are seeing that example live right in front of, right in front of our face with Deshaun Watson. Look at Deshaun Watson with the Texans, right? He is by far, undoubtedly, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. No one's questioning his talent. No one is saying, oh, the Texans are having a bad year. It's Deshaun Watson's fault. We should move on from Deshaun Watson. No, it's idiotic. Because anyone with a brain can see Deshaun Watson is not the issue in Houston. Bill O'Brien, as a general manager, did a terrible job of putting a team around him, giving him a terrible, um, giving him a terrible weapons to throw to, not having protection to give Deshaun Watson time, and despite the fact that Deshaun Watson is one of the best quarterbacks in the league, the Texans have just one win this year. They're going to miss the playoffs. And it's not Deshaun Watson's fault. Great quarterbacks can't overcome horrendous situations, horrendous organizations. Speaking of great quarterbacks, let's just take a look, right? Like, objectively, who, who do we argue, without a doubt, are great quarterbacks? Patrick Holmes, right? Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, throughout his career, Tom Brady. Lamar uh, Jackson, the reigning MVP, Aaron Rodgers. 
all these guys, right, Mahomes, Wilson, Brady, Rodgers, Jackson, all of them were drafted by good teams with extremely stable coaching situations. They went to organizations that had competent coaching, and more importantly, again, equally to your physical skills, they put them in positions to succeed. I'm not taking anything away from Patrick Mahomes right now. But what he's accomplished in his short career has been incredible. He might, he might, by the end of it all, be the best quarterback to ever play the game. Most accomplished, most talented. He has a potential. Not taking anything away from Patrick Mahomes. But if Patrick Mahomes went to the Jets, went to the Giants, maybe even with the Bears, if he wasn't with Andy Reid, if he didn't go to a first-place team, because let's not forget, the Chiefs trade up to draft Patrick Mahomes. They won the division. They went to the playoffs with Alex Smith. They, they hosted a playoff game with Alex Smith in the first year that Patrick Mahomes was on the roster. You have one of the best offensive minds in Andy Reid as your head coach. Very limited turnover. And a team that's ready to win. It was all made for Patrick Mahomes. They expected him to take him to the next level. And they took him to places they couldn't even imagine. Russell Wilson can stretch by the Seahawks. Defensive laden team first, right? Legion of Boom, that was a defensive minded team. Run the ball, play good defense. Russell Wilson wasn't asked to do too much. And now as he's developed in his career, now as he's refined his skills, that's an offensive led team. That is Russell Wilson's team. I can go to, through the list here Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, Aaron Rodgers. All in different ways were set up for success through the organization, through the talent around them. Because they weren't asked to be the savior, they weren't asked to be the cure-all. Let's even go, let's even go more recently, right? Because obviously all these names I'm listing are obviously great quarterbacks. Let's look at recent success for young quarterbacks. Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Back in 2017, the same draft that Sam Darnold was in with the Jets, which we'll get to him in a second here. But Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, two of the I don't want to say overlooked, but Baker Mayfield got a lot of hype. Sam Darnold got a lot of hype. Josh Rosen got a lot of hype. Josh Allen's a big question mark going to the Bills. Lamar Jackson is really a big unknown. A lot of doubts. They both go to stable organizations. They're able to surround them with talent. Now you look, Josh Allen has a team in the Bills that should win the AFC East this year. Lamar Jackson just won the MVP last year. They were able to thrive because the situations around them were stable. And they were put in positions to succeed. Look at Sam Darnold now. Let's go right to the Jets. Because he was in that same draft as Josh Allen. He was in that same draft as Jamal, uh, Lamar Jackson. What are we talking about with, jo- uh, with Sam Darnold? He's about to get traded. He's about to get picked. About to get on a new team. Because he wasn't, in the Jets' minds, able to cure them from all their illnesses. Or Ill- all their ailments, I should say. Excuse me. All their ailments. Despite the fact that their offense line was trash. They're wide receivers, honestly, of the, of the talent of me and you. But seriously, look, look at who Sam Darnold's throwing the ball to. Their talent is equivalent to me and you. The running back game has been a disaster. If Adam Gaze, a, a quarterback whisperer, an offensive genius, who ranks last in every offensive category this year, last year with the Dolphins. So Sam Darnold's been hurt by an awful supporting cast and incompetent coaching. Let's go to Baker Mayfield. Again, that same quarterback in that draft. Goes number one overall to the Browns. Baker Mayfield is really a pinata so far this season, despite the fact that the Browns are 4-2. and Because they've lost both games to really good teams in the Ravens and the Steelers and really weren't close. But let's look at Baker's situation, right? Because now there are already discussions. And again, working with my guy Ken Carman in Cleveland. He was a morning show there every single morning. He takes calls from fans every single day about Baker Mayfield and the Browns. The fan base is already... Despite the fact that Baker Mayfield has had four head coaches in three years, despite the fact that the offense that looks like he could actually fit in with Kevin Stefanski, have some, have some success with, he may only get one year. And if he doesn't win a playoff game or two, he could be out. The fans could basically be, all right, we're done with this guy. So despite the fact that he's had four head coaches in three seasons, never, never had one offense carry over to another year, he already could be on the block. He already could be traded or cut or benched. That turnover wreaks havoc to success. Look at even at Joe Burrow. The offensive line is getting him killed. He's not having time to be able to be successful because they can't protect him. We look at a guy like Justin Herbert, 
Chris goes to a team with talent in the Chargers. We're raving about Justin Herbert. We're looking at his big arm. Because he's making the, fa- the flashy plays because he has talent to throw the ball to. He has time to throw the ball, unlike Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. So history has shown just as important as your physical skills is the situation you go to. The Jets are one of the worst situations in all football. They're going to have a new head coach again in that, uh, after Adam Gase is fired, probably at the end of the season. But there's zero stability in the front office with ownership, with the team, with the roster that gives you any sort of hope, any sort of inclination that Trevor Lawrence could come in and have success. So if you're Trevor Lawrence, if you see the common denominator that these great quarterbacks have had, like Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, Aaron Rodgers, even look as recently like said, as Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, young quarterbacks who have success, who are on the quote-unquote hot seat, if you want to say quarterbacks are on the hot seat, and look at, the, look at the quarterbacks who are already given up upon, who already have a lot of pressure on them to win or they're out. Sam Darnold, which is the same situation you're about to go to, and Baker Mayfield, despite the fact he's had four head coaches in three years. The fans are done with him, and there's calls to bring in Matthew Stafford, bring in Matt Ryan, bring someone else in, because they're done with Baker. The situation you go to is equally as important, if not even more important, than the physical talents and skills that you have. So seeing this, Trevor wants you to realize, if I go to the Jets, I am screwed. I can't play my way out of this. He honestly, honestly, think about it. The Jets right now are probably closer talent-wise to Clemson than the second worst team in the NFL. The Jets are closer to a college team than they are the second worst team in the NFL. So now if you're Trevor Lawrence, why would you want to go there? Why would you want your career basically to fail before it even gets started because you're not given a chance to succeed sam donald has all the talent in the world again you hear me week in and week out salivating at the thought that sam donald could be a part of a different organization preferably as a colts fan i would love him on the colts but i think there's a lot of teams out there that would love to have sam donald over their current quarterback they believe that they can get a lot of success at him that the jets weren't able to get out of him so if you're trevor lawrence why would you want to go through that don't have your career kill before it even starts. Don't take the physical punishment. Don't take the criticism that comes with being the Jets quarterback because you aren't the savior. Because guess what? The savior philosophy of drafting the quarterback and everything else will get fixed does not work. A great quarterback cannot overcome a bad offensive line, a bad running game, bad head coaching, bad wide receivers. Trevor Lawrence has to realize that, get out ahead of it, and again, not allow his career to get derailed before it even starts. So hold out. F- pull whatever sort of leverage you got to do. Going back to college is not the option. You're going to the draft. You're going to get drafted. Do what you can to don't go to the Jets, to prevent yourself from getting drafted by the Jets. And then you get Eli Manning, who's regretting not going to the Chargers or forcing me out of San Diego. I think Philip Rivers would love to be on the Giants instead of the Chargers for his entire career. Look at, look at the two career trajectories. Look how we talk about them. Eli Manning, two-time Super Bowl winner. Philip Rivers, still trying to chase that. Still trying to chase that. Trevor Lawrence, look at history. History is a guide. History has shown you go to a bad organization, you're going to be bad. You go to a good organization with good coaches, competent run leadership, good players, you will have success. Don't let your career die before it even starts. Don't go to the Jets. Do whatever you got to do. Pull whatever moves you got to move. Sitting out of training camp, not playing, telling the Jets you're not going to play. Whatever you got to do, don't get drafted by the New York Jets. It will kill your career. It will kill it. It will end it before it even starts. So I'm curious your thoughts. Should Trevor Lawrence pull, pull an Eli Manning, pull a John Elway, prevent himself from getting drafted by the Jets? Should any college player basically call the shots and say, sorry, I'm not playing for you? I'm not going to do it. I'm not ruining my career by going to play for your bad organization. Do you have a problem with, with college kids basically calling their own shot, making their own demands? So get your thoughts. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSR underscore radio, at Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. And when we come back, the Cowboys, they are the Michigan football version of the NFL. 
I'll tell you what that means next. It is the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. You're, you're, you're listening to the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Welcome back to the Ryan Hickey Show right here on the World Wide Sports Radio Network. I guess it's a flow ride of Thursday now. Has to be, right? We, we don't get enough flow rider. That's, this is a guy. Banger after banger after banger. So we're going to keep the good vibes going here on the Ryan Hickey Show on this Thursday morning. Getting your thoughts. Should Trevor Lawrence force his way out of the Jets? Prevent the Jets from drafting him? Go somewhere else? Go anywhere else? Because as we've seen, good quarterbacks with great talent that go to bad organizations fail. Don't have a posi- they're not in a position to succeed. And I think if Trevor Lawrence goes to the Jets, his career is over before it even starts. So should he pull a Neil and Manning? Pull a John Elway and say, I'm not playing for you. I'm going somewhere else. And try to give his career actually a chance to flourish. Have it actually give himself a chance to succeed. Twitter, WWSR and underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show. Also on Twitter, you can comment on the Periscope live stream. Facebook, Worldwide Sports or Network. See my dad commented on there as well. So you can throw some comments on there. Get your thoughts as we roll on here. Hickey's Pickies, 15 minutes from now. Rob Young called a shot, guaranteed four to five right selections this week. We'll see how he can do. We'll see which, uh, which picks he's going with. It's a very tough week. Very, very, very tough slate, so we'll get his thoughts. 15 minutes or so. But I do want to get touch on the Dallas Cowboys. Because, wow, Monday night was embarrassing. Yet again, the Dallas Cowboys on national TV – Get blown out this time by the Cardinals, thirty-eight to ten in Monday Night Football. Four and two on the. I'm sorry, four and two. Holy cow! Two and four on the season. First place, but two and four on the season. Another year of the Cowboys underachieving. With the talent they have on offense and the expectations that they have, new head coach Mike McCarthy thinking that that was going to be the cure-all. Another Jerry Jones-led team is underachieving. And really, the question should be. Are we shocked? Should there even be a surprise at this point that a Dallas Cowboys team is underachieving, not living up to their potential? The parts don't equal the whole. Or some of the parts, I should say, don't equal the whole. It shouldn't be shocking because guess what? To me, this is kind of the revelation that I had watching that Monday night game. The Dallas Cowboys are the Michigan football version of the NFL. There's a ton of similarities. Here's what I mean by that. Number one, both world-class resources available to them. But not many teams in college football have the money, have the facilities, have the reach, the notoriety that Michigan football has. But you hear Michigan football, you think prestige, winning. There's an allure that comes with the Michigan football name. Dallas Cowboys is the same thing. America's team, right? The Dallas Cowboys. Look at Jerry World, AT&T, the Frisco facility that they have. Not many, if any, NFL teams can match the facilities, the fan base, the national, the national reach, excuse me, that the Dallas Cowboys have. Both Michigan and, the, and Dallas has every advantage in the world to attract the best players. Now, obviously, it's a little different than the NFL, but you have every advantage in the world at your fingertips to bring in the best free agents. To convince guys to sign with you. Convi- to convince guys to stay with you. Give that home count, hometown discount because plenty of players have already. So they both have world-class resources at their fingertips. Both are historically successful franchises, right? There's a ton of history that's followed with Michigan. That goes on with the Dallas Cowboys. Wolverines, 962 wins in college football. The most all-time. 11 national titles. They have those legends. Legends in coaching and playing that you always hear about. Tom Brady, Bo Schembechler, Lloyd Carr, Charles Woodson, Desmond Howard. We'll do Jim Harbaugh both as a coach and a player. The Cowboys had that same history. They had that same success in the past. Five Super Bowl trophies, right? Second all-time behind the Patriots and the Steelers. They also have an illustrious history of names. Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, Michael Irvin, Roger Staubach, Tom Landry. There's plenty of history there to show. You can have success and you can win here. So world-class resources, better than most, if not every single NFL team. And for the Cowboys, better or equal... To every other college football team, Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Michigan has those resources. Play of history, again, Michigan is the most winning program in college football. Dallas Cowboys, second most Super Bowls in the NFL. But what they also have in common, underachieving, falling short in expectations. Michigan, 
The biggest game, the biggest barometer for Michigan football every year is the game against Ohio State. That's your measuring stick. If you can't win, if you can win one game a year and it's against Ohio State, you're doing all right. Well, Michigan has lost to Ohio State 15 out of the last 16 years now. 15 out of the last 16. That's domination. They have zero cultural playoff appearances since it started in the 2014 season. And just once, just one time in the last 13 years, has Michigan finished a season with two losses or less? Think about that. Just once in 13 years, Michigan has had uh, less, or I should say, excuse me, two losses or less. Excuse me. Ooh, sorry about that. First sneeze I think I had on the air in a while. Oh, But so constant underachieving for Michigan. Lose to Ohio State, don't make the college football playoff, and again, once in 13 years, have you finished season with two losses or less? But every year, the hype is there. Every year, Michigan is ranked in the top 10, top 15 with expectations. So is this the year they take down Ohio State? Can this be the year they go to the Big Ten title game and win the Big Ten? Lots of underachieving. How about the Cowboys? Zero Super Bowls in 25 years since the last one in 1995. They haven't even been to an NFC title game. Haven't even been on the cusp of the playoffs or the Super Bowl, excuse me, since 1995. Oh, man. Excuse me. Oh, boy. I really got the sneezes coming on now. Oh, all right. Hopefully it passed. Whew. All right. Let's take a deep breath. Refocus. Refresh. I think we, we are good here. I apologize. All of a sudden, now I'm trying to sneeze everywhere. Like I was saying, the Dallas Cowboys haven't even been to an NFC title game since 1995. Which, guess what? That's the seventh longest current drought in the NFL. You know who else has longer droughts, but the Cowboys are in that, in that uh, company with? Teams like the Bengals, Washington, Lions, Browns, Dolphins, Bills. That's not the company you want to be with if you're the Dallas Cowboys. If you have expectations of basically Super Bowl or bust every single year. You are in playoff utility company with teams like the Bengals, the Browns, the Lions. Not where you want to be. So what's standing in the way? Because right, both both have a lot of similar um, comparisons from Michigan, really their, their biggest roadblock, we'll say their biggest hurdle is almost their pride in a sense, meaning by they favor and value academics being a, uh, a strong public university, being one of the, the hardest to get into, you know, having a real respected academics more than sports, which is fine. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's their priority. Other schools prioritize sports and success on the field more than academic success. Michigan does not do that. So that prevents you, you have high academic standards from getting some of the best players. Because let's be honest, it's rare, and Notre Dame has the same issue, it's rare when you get an elite college football player who also enjoys the classroom as much as the football field. For a lot of these kids, for a lot of these big-time players, it's the NFL, the NFL, the NFL. Fallback plan is, all right, doesn't work out, I'll figure something else out. So academics maybe aren't the priority. You're not into, it's not even, not even just being smart. It's being into the academics. It's challenging. You can be smart, but if you're not into it, Michigan's not the place for you. So you got to be into academics as much as you're into football. That prevents Michigan from recruiting the way Ohio State recruits, the way Clemson recruits, the way Alabama recruits. That's their roadblock. For Dallas, it's simple. Their roadblock is two words. One name, Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones is easily the biggest reason, the only reason, for their constant disappointment year in and year out. By far and away, he's a great businessman. One of the best businessmen maybe we've ever seen. You know what he's not good at? He's not a good football mind. He held on to Jason Garrett way too long because they were friends, because he liked Jason Garrett. So that team, that offense, continued to underachieve because you had a head coach not competent for the job. Then when he finally fires his friend, he seems to hire the wrong guy in Mike McCarthy because this has just been, you talk about disaster. It's been so bad already through six games with Mike McCarthy. that You already have players speaking out, calling out the coaching staff. Jane Slater of NFL Network did an incredible job reporting this. After the game on Monday night against the Cardinals, she had players tell her that the coaching staff is, quote, totally unprepared. They don't teach. They don't have any sense of adjusting on the fly. And the others said that the coaching staff, quote, just aren't good at their jobs. End quote. Think about that. Six games in. Coaching staff's not teaching. 
They have no sense of making adjustments. They aren't good at their jobs. Six games into the season. That's Jerry Jones' hire. So he seems to swing and miss at head coach. He's caused more drama than necessary with, with Dak Prescott's contract fiasco. And like, guess what? It's going to play out again this offseason and maybe even be more dramatic and more contentious because of the injury that Dak just suffered. So if he didn't want to pay him last year, all this boatload of money coming off one of Dak's best seasons, we'll see if he wants to pay him this year coming off a horrendous ankle injury. So that, that's going to continue. He's done a terrible job at rebuilding the, the defensive side of the football. Basically, ignore them. And it's a guy that always wants the flashy toy, always wants the shining object in the, in the mirror. Remember a few years ago, he had to be talked out by his, uh, by his son and other football minds of the Cowboys that don't take Johnny Manziel, take Zach Martin, an offensive lineman. Not sexy, but this would be the best thing for the Cowboys. If he was up to Jerry, he would have taken Johnny Manziel, and who knows where this Cowboys team would be. Maybe even worse than where they are right now. So the theme of the Cowboys continuing to flounder, continuing to underachieve, is because of Jerry Jones. And guess what? It's going to continue until Jerry Jones really hands over full control of the team over to his son. So despite the fact that the biggest roadblock for the Cowboys to success is their owner slash general manager, but the fact that he's not going anywhere anytime soon, his biggest goal of the rest of his life is to win one more Super Bowl. That's what he wants. And it's funny because it feels like the more Jerry tries to win, the harder he tries to win, the harder it becomes to actually win. So we're still sitting here because guess what? Dallas is still an iconic brand. They're still America's team. So they will get the hype year in and year out. Next year, Dak will come back. Oh, man, maybe this team now with year number two, Mike McCarthy, Dak comes back. This is the year for the Cowboys to win the NFCs. Make a real run at the playoffs. Be a real Super Bowl contender. Similar to Michigan. Every year we talk about the same thing. We'll be hyping them up, thinking they're better than they are because it's a big brand name. They've had success in the past. Because they have the resources available to be successful. But you keep coming back to the two roadblocks. From Michigan, the academic standards. For the Cowboys, it's Jerry Jones. We're going to be sitting here saying the same thing year in and year out. This team is underachieving. Seem not as good as it should be. And here we are sitting at another disappointing season. So I'm curious, do you have any faith the Cowboys can turn it around? Just in general. This year, too. I mean, the AFC East, is, I mean, the NFC East is brutal. So they, can they turn around this year? Can they turn it around under Jerry Jones and win one more Super Bowl? I'm curious on your thoughts of the future of the Dallas Cowboys. Facebook, Worldwide Sports Network, Twitter, WWSRN underscore radio. At Ryan Hickey Show, also on Twitter. When we come back, the much anticipated, much hyped Hickey's Pickies with Rob Young, guaranteeing four out of five. Question is correct. We'll get that when the Ryan Hickey Show returns right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Welcome back to the Ryan Hickey Show. Right here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And we are back here on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Getting right to it. I am very excited for Hickey's Pickies this week. Always a fun time, right? Always, always having fun, having some friends on, discussing some picks in, in a good and fun way. But our next guest, our next celebrity picker for week number seven here, very confident. This is a business-only transaction here. Already on social media earlier this week, called his shot. Went Babe Ruth guaranteeing four out of five selections correct. So far, only two people have done that. Lauren Clark sitting at 5-0 and oh for week number one, really set the bar high. And last week, my guy, Nick McCool, 4-1. and one. He's the only two who have even broke 500. Everyone else is under 500 so far. So this is a tough bar to climb. This is a really, really tough schedule. So I'm excited to see what our next celebrity guest picker. It is the great Rob Young. Rob, what's up, buddy? Hey, hey, great to hear from you. Thanks for having me on. I am really excited. You know, I'm looking to redeem myself from the, the outcome of the 2020 versus apocalypse that we had before sports are back. But now we have sports are back, and of course, you are putting out content ready for Hickey's Pickies. <laughs> I mean, for great name. I mean, just the name alone is just going to attract listeners. But you know, I'm hoping, like you said, I, I did call my shot. I took a shot at the uh, the Mongo Twitter account. <laughs> they were, uh, a li- there's a little bit of a Twitter beef going on, so 
we'll uh, we'll see. We're gonna try to uh, you know get you know I'm hoping for four. Lauren set the bar insanely high. That was that was awesome. But uh, but we'll see, and I'm excited to get it going. Yes, like you said, you are stirring up the Twitter the Twitterverse already, really causing some uh, some not controversy, but you're you're causing some attention. Let's say so. Uh, people will be watching. Let's say yes, the Mongo Twitter accounts. We're watching your picks very, very, very closely to see how they do. As a reminder, we have five games. We'll do one college this week, four NFL, plus an uh, opportunity for some bonus picks with an upset special. Any spread bigger than five, if your upset special hits, it's one point. If they flat out win, it's two points. So while Lauren is sitting there at 5-0, and oh, Rob, you go perfect here. You have a chance to go 6-0, and oh, even 7-0. and oh, Cement your place in first place. Really call your shot and pull a Babe Ruth moment. Are you ready to go here for week number seven? I am ready to go, and I will say one thing. I hope that the Mongo account, whoever it may be, have no idea who's behind it. I hope they are listening, and I hope that no listeners from KPMG are listening because I'm right now on the clock and put in a calendar block in my in my calendar so I can join. So I'm hoping nobody Wow. You know, that that's bonus points right there for calling out of work. Big, big meeting for Rob <laughs> this week. Just little do they know. Right. It is just a, uh, a different sort of meeting than usual. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we will start with the one college game so far. We'll go in the Big 12. Just a, a total mess that this year has been. But number 17, Iowa State, who beat Oklahoma a few weeks ago, getting three and a half points on the road at number six, Oklahoma State. Bobby, where are we leaning here in this pick? All right, so I got to be fully transparent. My knowledge for college football is pretty much bare minimum. I just know that Trevor Lawrence is the quarterback for Clemson, and that's essentially my knowledge of college football. Um so w- with this game, all I know about these teams is that Iowa State plays in Iowa and Oklahoma State plays in Oklahoma. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> um, but I do know that Mike Gundy is the head coach for Oklahoma State. So I think I'm going to take the favorites here, number six, Oklahoma State. I don't think that three and a half is, is, much, too, is too much of a cover. Um, so I'm going to take the undefeated Oklahoma State team. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think they'll, they'll beat Ohio State by at least four, and they'll cover. I'm with you, Bobby. Great minds think alike. And, first of all, honestly, I think the less information you have, the better. Again, see Lauren Clark go 5-0. and oh. So the, the less info I think, the better. So, you know, I'm going to roll with the expert here. You roll with Oklahoma State. I'm with you. They, they, they call themselves the Cowboys. They say go pokes. They have guns. They, they, they have paddles that they, that they hit on the sideline. And I'm with you. The home field advantage for however many cra- uh, fans there are, Mike Gundy, a high-flying offense. They get their quarterback back. I'm with you. In a year that's been a total nightmare for the Big 12, maybe Oklahoma State can at least give them some sort of hope. The favorite, given three and a half, I'm with you. With how much points are scored in the Big 12, I think that's, a, that's an easy number for them to cover and win. I'm with you. As I say, go pokes. We'll, we'll shoot some air pistols in the air here. Both of us on Oklahoma State to cover the three and a half at home. Go Pokes, baby. Go Pokes. Look at this guy right now. Boom, boom, boom. We're shooting the pistols. Pistol Pete will be fired up if he, if he was listening, which I'm sure he is. He knows we're picking this game. We'll go to the if NFL. I'm right, oh, if sorry, I'm right, I might, be, I, I might be going to get a second education at Oklahoma State. That, and I'm, I'm sure they give you a nice scotch. They'll do it for free. They'll welcome you with open arms. Welcome. I like it. <laughs> Shake my Gundy's hand. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe he'll get a mullet. He, he's known for his mullet. Yeah, is it yeah. a mullet in, in your uh, interest at all? Uh, it could be. If, if, I, if I'm living in Oklahoma, I could be a different man. I don't even know if, if I'd be going by <laughs> Rob over there. I, I, I don't know what they'd be calling me, but I, I think I would have to grow out the mullet just to kind of fit in and not be a New Yorker. Kind of a nice, like, I'm trying to think, a tanner or, like, some sort of gunner, like, you know, some sort of Midwestern, like, Oklahoma plain sort of name, I think, you know, could be a good second identity there for you. I, I think we're onto something. I think we are. The mullet gunner is, is his new name in the Midwest. He get brand new identity out there in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Gunner Young. <laughs> Love it. As we say, go pokes both on Oklahoma State plus, or sorry, minus three and a half for the college game. I was saying this, Rob, look at the slate of games we have. I think this is one of the toughest slates to pick from. So I give you a lot of credit for going for calling your shot here at four and five. Um, right. This is one of those games where I had a lot of issue with. Steelers getting one point on the road at the Titans. Both undefeated. Both really trying to fight for that spot to maybe be the one team to give the, the Chiefs a run for their money. Which way are you landing this one? Oh, excuse me. To your point, Hick, this, I had some trouble with this one. I have, I've been back and forth. You know, we have two undefeated teams, Steelers and Titans, both at 5-0. and oh, And they are, they, are, they are very good teams. I would say the Titans have the surprisingly high-powered offense led by Tannehill, 
against the, in my opinion, the number one defense in the league, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. So with that, I would say disadvantage Steelers slightly, just based on Devin Bush. Uh, you know, he, he is out, so that's that's a big loss for them. But as I said, I, I've been going back and forth, on, and I did a little research. I wanted to see what teams the Steelers and the Titans have beaten this year, and they both really haven't beaten good teams. Right? I, the, I know the Steelers beat the Giants week one, uh, beat the Eagles, Browns. Uh, they both beat the Texans, both beat the Broncos. So they, their schedule hasn't been a challenge. So this is their first true challenge, right? Mm-hmm. And you know what they say? defense does win championships and i originally did have the titans but i think the steelers defense is is gonna really come knocking on Tannehill's door do what they can to stop the monster and derrick henry and i think the steelers do pull this one out but it's gonna be a a great game it's a tight one and this is one that i said i definitely did struggle with but i'm locking in steelers plus one all right steelers plus one so far bobby i am with it we are two for two in agreement i am with you on the steelers plus one and honestly you laid it out perfectly i like pittsburgh's defense a little bit more and to be honest, I like Ryan Tannehill. I think the Titans are, are legitimately good. I just trust Ben Roethlisberger, honestly, more in a situation like this. So you're giving me one point. I think these two teams are pretty close. I'll take the one point. The Steelers I think they do keep it close. I mean, they, I guess they basically have to win outright in order for us to really win unless they lose by like a walk-off field goal and lose by one. We'll, I guess, sort of push. But, hey, I'm oh, with you. God, don't, <laughs> don't, put, don't speak that into reality. <laughs> There, there is Bob at four zero and one or three zero and one right there. Oh, just nothing calling my <laughs> shot. That'd be brutal. I am with you. I'm taking the Steelers one point on the road. Um, great minds think alike. So far, we are two for two, both in Oklahoma State, both on the Steelers. How about another one? This is a NFC West battle. Seahawks minus three and a half at Arizona, coming off that Monday night blowout over the Cowboys. Which way are you going with this one? So this one was actually out of the slate of picks that I have. I thought this was actually the easiest Ooh. pick. I, I, I think this is actually a, a no-brainer, guaranteed. Wow. This isn't obviously wow. a you know up to special, but this is my guaranteed lock of the day. Where you're going to input that 100%, locking in the Seahawks at minus three and a half. Wow. And for for a few reasons. One, uh, let Russ cook. Right, this guy is probably right now the the MVP of the league. The guy's been unbelievable with his weapons. Uh, the, their defense has been shaky at times, but I don't think, based on what I saw on Monday night for, from the Cardinals and the Cowboys, although Kyle Murray, if you're looking at it from like a fantasy perspective, yeah, he might have had a great day, but he did a lot on the ground, and he didn't look good through the air. He didn't look accurate. He seemed disconnected with DeAndre Hopkins. Kenyon Drake cannot move the ball. He, he has not looked good, and he was just able to do so against a terrible Cowboys defense. So I think that Monday night game was a little bit of a fluke. Uh, the, the Seahawks only having to cover three and a half, I think, is way too low of a spread. So I am locking in Seahawks 100%. Wow. Our first disagreement. Lock of the week. Not only wow. is he locking in four to five, he's locking in Seahawks minus three and a half. The Rob Young specialty lock of the week. I'm going to disagree because you know why? I think the Seahawks defense, they stink. Right? They're, they're not good. Russell Wilson, I'm with you. Let Russ Cook, he's been one of the best players. He's been the best player in the NFL so far. But what concerns me is that the Seahawks' defense isn't stopping anybody. And I'm not sure how it's getting any better this week. I know they come off the bye week, but that doesn't really give me much encouragement that they can actually slow down an offense. I like the way the Cardinals uh, move the ball. I, I was more encouraged by the Cardinals' offense, considering that it wasn't really kind of clicking. It was, like, Kyle Murray did struggle. But they still put up 30 points against the Cowboys. I understand the Cowboys aren't stopping anyone. But the Seahawks really aren't stopping anyone. So I think the Seahawks can win this game. But to me, at least, I think it's going to be an offensive shootout. So if there's going to be a lot of points scored, it's going to be a close game. Honestly, I'll take the Cardinals at home to cover the three and a half. I think they'll, they'll keep it close enough to where they will lose within three, or I guess within four, I should say. So I'm saking the Cardinals to cover at home. Let Russ Cook, 38-35, 35-32, something like that. I'll take it. But I think the Cardinals could keep up offensively for most of the game with the Seahawks and at least do cover that big three and a half spread. So our first disagreement so far. Oh, sorry, Bobby. You can go ahead. No, I, I want to make two quick points. Sure. To your point, when when, when we look at the spreads, right, three and a half is a tough spread to take, right? I mean, it's, it's a field goal. So if, if you're, uh, you know, better out there, at, you know, they always teach you, you know, buy a point, right? So in this case, it's definitely important to buy a point. Because <laughs> I can see, you know, the Seahawks winning by a field goal. I can yeah. 100% see that. And and that's why I was that, that was the only thing to make me uh, uh, slightly undecided. But like I said, I'm still keeping it as as my lock. I think that they that in this battle of the birds, I think they do 
take them out. And I want to make one additional point. Sure. I did. I was listening before to to you know the show and some of the segments, which I want to add. I didn't say it earlier. Hickey, great show, unbelievable content week in week out. Everybody should be listening every Monday and Thursday to this guy. But I, I will pay you thing. after the show. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> you know my Venmo. <laughs> I will say there was some discussion around Antonio Brown, and I want to say, and I completely agree. The fact that they want to, they are pursuing Antonio Brown doesn't make any sense. They are rocking and rolling with two of probably a, two of the top 15 wide receivers, if not top 10 wide receivers in the league in, in Lockett and DK Metcalf. And, I don't, and they want to bring in Antonio Brown for, for what reason? The guy is a distraction. He's a headache. And they had David Moore. And he's made some highlight catches this, this week as that third wide receiver. So it might, And he already has the connection with, with Russ. So I don't know why they would want to, to, you know, to, to get in the way of that. I just picture Pete Carroll chomping on his gum, looking <laughs> at Antonio Brown highlights and saying to the GM, you know, we got to get this guy. That's, that's, that's my take on that. Love that. This guy's give and takes. Dishing out some knowledge, dropping picks, locking up guarantees. We're, we got it all here with the Robbie Young experience. This is better than I could have ever imagined so far. We, I know we're short on time, so we'll go through these next two pretty quickly here, Bobby. Yes. yes Buccaneers yes. minus three and a half at the Raiders in Las Vegas. What are we thinking? So here I'm going to take the Raiders. Uh, they're coming off a bye, and I think Gruden, you know, he's one of the top coaches in the league. I think he's going to coach his his players well and prepare and prepare them well. I also don't like the Buccaneers going out West. You know, mm-hmm. you got old man Brady behind, behind center going out, you know, to, to Los Angeles. I don't, I don't necessarily like it. Um, so for those two reasons and the three and a half spread, you know, to my point earlier with that, you know, the three and a half to be close, I'm going to, I'm going to take the Raiders here plus three and a half. The number's a little big. I would agree with you. It does worry me a little bit. I'm still going to go with Tampa Bay because I think what they showed on in their win over Green Bay, the flashes, more importantly defensively, what they can do. This team is a very full, like very well-rounded team. Like it's not just a Brady, you know, Brady you have to lead them to victory. Their defense is really good. I think really underrated, and I like their run game. So I think that they put it all together. I think they can carry that again into Las Vegas. I do think they'll beat the Raiders, cover the spread. So I'm taking the Buccaneers. You're taking the Raiders. Last game, Monday Night Football, Bears getting six on the road in Los Angeles against the Rams. This is another tough one. And I, I was back and forth on this. Um, and at the end of the day, sometimes you got to look deep into, you know, you can compare the teams this and that, right? You got golfers, falls, like obviously the golf advantage. Then you look at, you know, the, the lack of running game of both teams. It's kind of a, kind of a draw. Rams have more weapons. And then you got the defense. The Bears have a great defense, and Rams have a very good defense. It's when you're when you're when you're tying them, you know, when when you're pinning them up against each other, uh, you got to look a little deeper. And I look a little deeper, and I realize that the Rams on prime stink. They just beat the Cowboys in Week One on Sunday Night Football by three points, and at that time we thought, oh, you know, the Cowboys, you know, we're going to be a good team, and they've obviously proved that they're not a good team especially that defense. I mean, they put up 20 points against that Cowboys defense. And then last week against San Francisco, they were non-existent. So based on that, I'm taking the Bears plus six, and I'm going to double down Uh-oh. on the Bears as my upset special of the week. Lock it in. Nick Foles, the guy is going to play big in prime time. No pun intended for those that know. Nick Foles, <laughs> Bears, lock it in. Wow. Our first double dip. We've not had a double dip where a game is included in this slate, and they use that for the, the upset special. Wow. Bobby calling his shot going two for one, really putting all his eggs in the basket here. Really, you're setting yourself up here for a big, big, big weekend. Look at this guy, a math guy. He knows what he's doing. I'm with you, though, actually. I hate the Bears. I think they're a total fraud. I think their record – is I mean people say you know Bill Parcells your record are is what you say or the re- you are what your record says you are there we go, but oh god I hate the Bears so much I think they're such a bad team, but with that said though too you get the Rams all four of the Rams wins comes from the NFC East you're a Giants fan you know the NFC East very well it is not a good division this year it's not too hard for a team to beat all four teams from the NFC East so that does worry me I'm with you I think the Rams actually will win this game so I'm not going to take the Bears my that special but six points is a massive number for two teams that. Have a good defenses. I don't really expect either one to kind of light it up. We saw the Rams when they played the 49ers, how they can just kind of get contained. I'm taking the Bears plus six. I think the Rams win, but I think take the Bears with the points. You, sir, using the Bears plus six as your upset special. I'll stick in the NFL, I'll stick in the NFC. Panthers, seven and a half point underdogs to, this, uh, to the Saints going to New Orleans. 
Teddy Bridgewater going back to the Dome against Drew Brees, a guy used to back up for a while. Panthers have been playing some spunky football. They've been playing hard. Even in their losses, they're playing competitive. I think they will keep this game competitive again. Seven and a half for a division game for a team playing as hard and as well as the Panthers are. I think Teddy Bridgewater playing a little chip on his shoulder, saying, hey, you know, you could have could have kept me instead of old man Drew Brees. I think he goes in there, <laughs> plays motivated. Panthers plus seven and a half on the road in the Dome in, uh, in New Orleans. I think do cover. Fingers crossed they get a big upset. Give me some extra points, but... That is it. Wow. So we have, we're both on Oklahoma State. We're both on the Steelers. I have the Cardinals. You have the Seahawks. I have the Buccaneers. You have the Raiders. We are both on the Bears. You double down on the Bears plus six is your upset special. For me, the Panthers plus seven and a half. I guess the Saints is my upset special. Bobby, I know you got to run. This was a blast. I can't wait to see how these results turn out on Monday night. Yes. I, this was a great time as always. And I just want to add one extra thing that I was looking into. I want to share my almost upset special of the Ooh. week, and that's going to be Broncos, Chiefs. I don't think they, they'll cover. I think the Broncos actually lose by 10, so they won't cover the, the 9.5, but I was close. That is my almost upset special of the week, and I also want to add the reason, another reason I'm picking that. The Broncos are 4-1 against the spread this year. Wow. Shockingly. Look at this guy. This guys breaking so, down numbers, giving secondary upset specials. This is <laughs> holy smoke. Like, you, you are doing it all today. Had to. Had, had, to, had to come big. Had, that's why I'm hoping Mongo's listening, because I don't come in unprepared. <laughs> he called the shot early in the week, did not disappoint this week on Hickey's Pickies. Bobby, that was a ton of fun. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Can't wait to see how this play out. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully I don't go 0-5. <laughs> I, might have to, I might have to delete my Twitter account for, <laughs> for a week or so. That's true. This is by far the most polarizing edition of Hickey's Pickies. Oh, a lot of fun. Can't wait to see how it turns out, Bobby. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate it. Great show as always. Talk to you soon. Later, stud. That is that is too funny. That is that was a lot of fun. Bobby calling a shot earlier in the week, coming in hot today, dropping knowledge, dropping tidbits, secondary upset specials, locking in guarantees within guarantees. This has been a ton of fun. We do appreciate Bobby for coming on, giving us his thoughts. Very excited. Very, very, very excited to see how this week turns out for him. Uh, like you said, it is a polarizing topic for sure. He's a polarizing man. Got really social media churning up. So if he does well, he'll let him know. If he doesn't do well, I think social media will come. The Twitter mob will go after Rob Young. We appreciate Rob for coming on. We appreciate you for listening. Really do appreciate making you or making us, I should say, part of your Thursday. Hopefully you're having a great week so far. Uh, So enjoy your weekend. A ton to get into. The Big Ten is back. Big Ten football is back. So let's go if you're a a fan of Big Ten football. Definitely an exciting weekend. Yours truly is very, very, very excited for that. Big Penn State uh, return, so couldn't wait for that. So enjoy your weekend of college football. Enjoy the NFL. We appreciate you joining us, and hopefully you'll be back on Monday morning to break down everything we saw from the weekend. We'll be back on Monday right here on the World Wide Sports Network. It, it, it's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Radio Network.